Welcome to Motor Week Illustrated. In the next half hour, we'll be looking at everything from swamp buggies to stock cars. But the racing spotlight remains on Daytona and the final event of Speed Week's 1984, tomorrow's Daytona 200. A top field of international stars is gathered for that 180 mile per hour two-wheeled showdown that caps a week of racing, partying, and other biker fun on and around the world's most famous beach. This big happening dates all the way back to 1937. Let's take a look now at what's happened so far this week. Number 19 world champ Freddie Spencer has dominated preliminaries to the 200, including yesterday's Bell Superbike 100 miler. Spencer got a slow start from the pole, but as the field for America's most prestigious superbike race funneled through turn one, it was Spencer and number 84, his factory Honda teammate Fred Merkel, who emerged as the front runners. Spencer, seeking an unprecedented third straight win in this race, took the lead from Merkel on the third lap and never looked back. Meanwhile, young Merkel's hopes for second place evaporated early. He had dropped a couple of valves coming out of the chicane. It would have been a pretty easy second place. It's pretty disappointing. Spencer, meanwhile, made a brief and flawless stop for fuel at mid-race while privateer John Betancourt and Sam McDonald on a borrowed factory Honda staged a spirited battle for second. Spencer came home an easy winner. Runner-up McDonald passed Betancourt on the last lap. Now, Fast Freddy wants to be the first man to win the Superbike race and the 200 in the same year. He took the first step toward that goal in Thursday qualifying. He'll start from the pole tomorrow. Being America's biggest race, and, and it's really the only opportunity that we get to ride in from the, the home crowd. And it's a very prestigious race. Um, it's one of the races that, uh, that I've always wanted to win, and so it's kind of like a boyhood dream. And, in the last four years, we've been going really good, but hopefully this year we'll win it. Here's a look at the top ten qualifiers. Kenny Roberts, defending champ, starts second. And another former winner, New Zealand's Graham Crosby, goes from sixth starting spot. In recent years, the Daytona competition scene has expanded to include half-mile dirt track racing. That realm of two-wheeled action dominated by riders from Michigan. They played to a big crowd last Sunday. The Michigan Mafia cleaned up the Bush Half Mile, a major tune-up for Camel Pro Series dirt track stars like Ted Booty of Lansing, Michigan. He's pushed off by bike owner Tex Peel of Flint, one of the sport's legendary tuners. A two-time race winner, Booty likes this track. It's uh, a little bit slippery. Uh, with the sun and the wind the way it is, it's hard to keep the water into it to keep the dust down and uh, make it a little bit faster. But uh, other than that, it's pretty smooth. It's a pretty good racetrack. In his heat race, Booty met former national champ number five, Gary Scott of Ohio, who took the lead from the pole. But Booty used all the body English he could muster to slip inside and take the fast heat win and the pole for the feature. For the fifth time in eight years, the national champ comes from Michigan. There goes number one. That's Randy Goss of Heartland, who rode his factory Harley to a heat race win. And that set up the main event when the green light flashed. It was number 16, Ronnie Jones, who went to the front. Booty was second, Goss fourth. Last Saturday, Motor Week showed you Ronnie Jones narrowly missing the indoor short track championship. Sunday, he ran up front until Booty closed in on number 12. National champ Goss skating around the precarious high line, trying to pass them both. But at the end of the backstretch, Booty and Goss put the Wolverine 1-2 on Oklahoma's Jones. The only remaining question now, which Michigan guy will win? The answer to that question was determined on the last lap. Watch Goss, second place, great effort on the outside. He's all over the racetrack, but to no avail. Booty hangs on, and he becomes the first three-time winner of this Daytona Dirt Track preseason classic. Brow, the third Michigan rider in the top five. All right, now the motocross stars are at center stage at Daytona. Later, Bob Varsha will have a report on the Daytona Supercross, and we'll turn our attention to stock car racing when Motor Week continues. And Bobby Allison were pronounced dead by our contributing editor, Jerry Garrett. That after Allison blew up in the first two races of the year. Well, perhaps Bobby was listening because a fast track and an Allison comeback were the Winston Cup stories last weekend at Rockingham, North Carolina. Ned Jarrett reports. Record speed seems to be the thing this year. Harry Gantz set a new track record in winning his first Bush Pole since the National 500 at Charlotte back in 1982. But the day didn't start out good for outside pole sitter Darrell Waltrip in car number 11, while Harry Gantt pulled away in car number 33. Waltrip started backpedaling through the field. His left rear axle broke. 
Traffic jammed up behind him, causing Blackie Wangren to spin in car number 39. Sterling Marlin in car number 23 was also involved. It took Waltrip's crew 14 laps to install a new axle. Gant, Neil Bonded in number 12, Terry Labonte in the blue number 44, Lake Speed in the white number one, and Dick Brooks in the Ford number 90 traded the lead back and forth to the delight of the record 44,000 fans. The track stayed green for almost 300 laps. Brooks Ford seemed to have the handling edge, a key factor here. Bonnet bit the dust with a carburetor problem which caused his car to catch fire. Tim Richmond was in the hunt in car number 27 until he crashed on lap 319. That bunched the field up. Nobody had paid much attention to Bobby Allison in car number 22 who had started back in 17th, but he was there. On lap 358, he and Brooks battled for third. They touched coming off turn two. Brooks went round and round. Allison continued. Part of the steering system was bent on Brooks Ford, which put him in the garage area. Then 13 laps later, the biggest crash of the day came when Lenny Pond blew the engine in his car number four going into turn three. Harry Gant chose the wrong route through the mess. When the smoke had cleared, they had to red flag the race for about 35 minutes while the inside guardrail was replaced. But when the race resumed, Allison showed his strength in the Buick number 22 and won his first race of the 1984 season. There had been rumblings of problems in the Die Guard organization because of two blown engines in the first two races. Robert Yates now also builds engines for Richard Petty, who finished fourth. That didn't sit too well with Allison and some of the other crew members, but a meeting with owner Bill Gardner and the Rockingham win should ease the pressure. I'm really thrilled. Uh, you know, it's been a, a tough deal, and uh, we had a little bit of a bad start, but that old Die Guard crew came through... Uh, Oh, Robert Yates give us plenty of ponies for under the hood and the whole deal. With help from that long stretch of green flag racing, Bobby Allison set a new event record on Sunday. That was the fastest 500 ever run at Rockingham. Uh, Robert Yates took a lot of heat when four of the five engines he built for drivers in the Daytona 500 blew up. Turns out Robert got some bad cams from a supplier. Things got even hotter when Allison blew another Yates engine at Richmond two weeks ago. But Yates, too, made a comeback at Rockingham, giving Bobby the horses he needed to win. For that accomplishment, Robert Yates gets our Wrangler U.S. Air Force Reserve Behind the Scenes Award. And old Robert's now in the running for a Honda VT500 Ascot motorcycle that goes to our year-end Behind the Scenes Award winner. Now the comeback of Darrell Waltrip at Rockingham. After he lost 15 laps in the pits to that broken axle, Darrell came back to finish in the top 10. That enabled him to hold on to a narrow lead in the Grand National standings after three of 30 races. For the past several weeks, Grand National Railbirds have been asking, where is Warner Hodgden? Partners with Junior Johnson in the Johnson Hodgden Racing Team that sponsors Waltrip and Neil Bonnet, and also the part owner of several racetracks, Hodgden, the California industrialist, has missed the first three races this year. That includes the race he sponsors, the Warner Hodgden 500 last Sunday. Well, this week, Hodgden told us he's been busy with Southern California business deals, and that's why he's not been at the races, and he denied reports he's in any financial trouble. Hodgden's wife reportedly carried a check for $110,000 to Rockingham to pay sponsorship and other fees related to that race. NASCAR's Bush Late Model Sportsman Series ran on Saturday at Rockingham. That division allows entrants to run lighter weight cars if they're equipped with smaller displacement engines. Only one driver at Rockingham chose the smaller car, and he drove it to a big victory. Again, Ned Jarrett. Sam Ard brought his number double zero Uzmobile with the 311 cubic inch engine. He sat on the pole and dominated the race. His biggest competition came from Ron Bouchard in car number 47 and Jack Ingram in car number 11. My son Glenn took a hard lick in his Ford number 24 when the accelerator hung going into turn three. Ingram was close to Ard at the finish, but only because of a late caution. It was Ard's second win in three races on the Bush circuit this year. For Motor Week Illustrated, this is Ned Jarrett at the North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham. Well, just ahead on Motor Week, the latest political developments from the world of international endurance racing, and we'll take a look at a different approach to selling cars. This association, IMSA, and the Paris-based International Auto Sport Federation, known in French as FISA, have different theories about endurance road racing. FISA runs the World Championship, noted for two things. Its races are all Porsche parades, and its rules restrict the amount of fuel available to each car. The promoter of America's premier endurance race doesn't think very much of that formula in Europe. We don't think that uh, motor racing is an economy run. They ought to be able to 
get to the finish line first. That's our definition of racing. IMSA uses a different formula for American races like the 24-hour, juggling engine sizes and car weights to produce close competition. And it works. Six different engine chassis combinations scored wins last year, and apparently that success has been noted in Europe. Last week, President Jean-Marie Ballest of FISA said he'll ask that group's executive committee to change the bulk of its rules and open the European series to IMSA cars. Now, while that represents a major endorsement of the IMSA format, there is one stumbling block to a uniform worldwide set of rules for endurance road racing. Ballast has also proposed an engine formula that would render uncompetitive such economical stock block motors as Chevys and Jaguars. Those are prominent in IMSA racing. Asked about that, IMSA President John Bishop told us this week, and we quote, our holy grail is keeping the stock block competitive, unquote. Now, Ballast's remarks came in a press conference called for a much different reason, to refute charges of financial wrongdoing within FISA's Formula One community and accusations that Frenchman Ballast collaborated with the Nazis during World War II. Those charges were made in a recently published book by a former editor of the French sporting paper, L'Equipe. Former World Endurance Road Racer John Paul, meanwhile, remains a fugitive in a federal drug investigation. This week, Paul's wife, Hope, was arrested in Florida. She's charged with perjury and witness tampering in connection with Paul's case. And now Porsche's planning a fundamental change in the way it sells cars in America. Other automakers will keep a close eye on that plan to see if it has implications for them. Porsche wants to dump the traditional franchise dealer system standard throughout the industry. In that system, dealers buy cars from manufacturers or their distributors and then sell them to customers. Porsche's alternative is a network of company-owned regional sales, delivery, and service centers. Current dealers would lose their franchises and be reduced to taking catalog orders for company-owned cars. It would change the business completely because we operate directly with the customer. We feel like we do contribute something to the customer. Besides concern for the traditional dealer-customer relationship, Porsche dealers are also upset that their profits will be cut in half by the new plan. Porsche hopes to implement its new program at the end of August when its current American distribution contract with Volkswagen of America runs out. But that timetable may have suffered a blow this week. A regional Volkswagen distributor challenged the plan with a $100 million lawsuit. Now let's go to Jim Roller for a report on the soggy sport of swamp buggy racing. Welcome to the Mile of Mud, the swamp buggy racing capital of the world. For 35 years, the faithful have gathered in Naples, Florida for this February exhibition of off-the-wall racing. And what do the fans think of this mud-slinging madness? I, I like it very much so far. It's different than anything I've seen before. <laughs> uh, his uh, suspicion of ignorance is very messy. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, Classes of racing range from two-wheel drives and four-wheel drive jeeps to these bits of technological wizardry. Like bugs from a monster movie, these babies run 20 to 25 feet in length and are jacked up for lots of ground clearance. David Sims tells us the rules are pretty much free. You make a frame of your own choice, whatever material to like, and then the drivetrain is uh, whatever power source you want to use, and usually some heavy-duty axles. Uh, we run the Oldsmobile engine that puts out about 485 cubic inches. Tall, skinny tires help drivers negotiate deep spots in the course known as seepy holes at speeds upwards of 35 miles an hour. Not bad through four foot of water. Sims and his Oldsmobile-powered buggy Shag Nasty had no trouble this time around, negotiating the seepy holes with ease on his way to the win. The Mile of Mud will host the October World Championships. That's when all the best strut their stuff in this, one of the world's most unusual sporting races. This is Jim Roller reporting. And in Texas, these guys will do 45 races worth $2 million this year. 83 outlaw champ Steve Kinzer was on hand to begin his title defense against the likes of Doug Wolfgang, 80 and 81 series runner-up. And Bobby Davis Jr. voted most improved outlaw driver last year. He hopes to give Kinzer a run for the title in 84. 
Saturday's 20-lap main event set the front two rows for Sunday's point-paying feature. Number seven, Tim Green, running his first full outlaw schedule since 1980, led it flag to flag. But the year's first point-paying race belonged to Kinzer, the reigning king of the outlaws. The Bloomington, Indiana native kept his number 11 out front for 25 of 30 laps and then held off Wolfgang's ferocious late race charge to win. Bobby Allison edged pole sitter Green to take third. Elsewhere, the racing world lost a fine driver last weekend. Mike Mosley probably deserved more success than he had as an IndyCar driver, although his last to first place charges on mile tracks like Milwaukee and Phoenix are fondly remembered by fans of oval racing. We also recall that Mosley twice cheated death at Indianapolis. In 1971, he lost a wheel, triggering this multi-car pileup. A year later, he hit the wall again in the same spot. Mosley suffered serious burns in both those accidents. Last year at the Indy 500, driving for the Craco team, Mike enjoyed a front row start, his best ever in the 500. But once again, the race ended in disappointment. He was uninjured in this spin, but his Craco deal subsequently fell apart and though not officially retired, Mike Mosley was without a ride for the 84 season. Last Saturday evening, Mike Mosley was killed in a highway crash in the California desert southeast of Los Angeles. He was en route home from an off-road outing with his son, who suffered minor injuries in that crash. And at El Centro, California last Saturday, West Coast three-quarter midget star Ron Cruzman was killed in a racing crash. That was the first fatality in the 27-year history of the National Midget Racing Association. Elsewhere, the 1984 Indy 500 is a sellout. A quarter of a million grandstand tickets have been mailed out, making this the earliest sellout in the long history of the race. And now for a progress report on the big Daytona Supercross and other late news, let's go to Bob Varsha. The Daytona Supercross final is going on right now. Earlier, Honda-mounted Bob Hanna, a two-time Daytona Supercross champion, ran away with the first of four qualifying heats. Other heat winners included Hanna's teammate Johnny O'Mara, Yamaha's Brock Glover, and Kawasaki's Jeff Ward. Most of those same stars were in action last Sunday at Gainesville, Florida. The occasion was the opening of the American Motorcyclist Association National Championship season, and winners were crowned in three classes of competition. Jeff Ward, number four here, is red hot. He and his Kawasaki have been the surprise success story of 1984 Supercross. Sunday in the 125cc National Championship opener, Ward won both his races to take the overall win. He beat Honda's national class champion, Johnny O'Mara, en route to that victory. The 250cc class featured a battle between Yamaha's number 17, Rick Johnson, and number six, Bob Hanna of Team Honda, making a comeback from injuries suffered in an off-season crash. Johnson won the first moto, but in the second race, he suffered suspension problems that gave the moto victory and the overall win to Hanna. And in the open class, defending national champion David Bailey, number one, had a field day. He swept both his races to open his title defense in perfect form. Today's 100-mile international lightweight race fell to American Wayne Rainey. The defending national superbike champion took an 11-second victory from Graham McGregor of England and West Germany's Martin Wimmer. Americans Dave Aldana and Dave Busby rounded out the top five. Time now to name our champion spark plug racer of the week. During the off-season, number 12 Ted Booty picked up one of the best rides in Grand National Racing on Tex Peel's very fast Harley-Davidson. In his first oval track outing of the year at Daytona, Booty whipped a star-studded field. This guy is a legitimate 1984 title contender. Ted Booty becomes our champion spark plug racer of the week. He's in the running for a Honda 500 Interceptor motorcycle that will go to our racer of the year. Now, Bike Week at Daytona has a little of everything, including its own movie premiere. Grand Prix star, state-of-the-art stunts, and music by Duran Duran and Queen highlight the British film Space Riders. The Daytona Bike Week debut gives fans a different look at the 83 GP season. Number seven, Barry Sheen, British playboy and GP veteran stars as himself. This is a fictional story told with actual race footage. World champ Freddie Spencer, number three, plays Barry's teammate. The bad guy is Kenny Roberts, three-time world champ. Sheen has seen some comebacks from horrible crashes, one of which is reenacted. And the plot is, of course, assembled from proven Hollywood elements. You'll find Mr. Sheen wrecking fast cars, fighting in bars, and doing all the other things that one would expect of a glamorous motorcycle racing star. Of course, Barry Sheen is a newlywed, so all of that fooling around is purely for the benefit of the cameras. Now let's take one last look ahead at the kind of action we're going to be seeing next Saturday on Motor Week. 
We'll watch motorcycles at 180 miles an hour as Daytona 200 stars like Kenny Roberts and Freddie Spencer perform their wondrous high-speed ballet. We'll check out the rough and tumble highlights of today's Daytona Supercross and see if last year's winner Bob Hanna can make it two in a row. And we'll be joined in the studio by World of Outlaws Sprint Car star Sammy Swindell. He'll be on hand to talk about sprinters and about his transition to stock cars. Finally today, I'll predict that Kenny Roberts will win tomorrow's Daytona 200 again. And we'll be back next Saturday with another edition of Motor Week Illustrated. I'm Dave Despain.